So thank you to everyone for attending the Industry Leaders Lecture Series, Solar Energy, Battery Energy Storage, and Microgrids. This hour-long webinar will be recorded, and there will be an opportunity for all questions to be answered after the presentation. Just leave your questions in the Q&A chat box below, if attending virtually. Now I'd like to present the Dean of the College of Engineering and Computing Sciences here at New York Institute of Technology, Dr. Bob Akhtaheshti. Thank you, Sarah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to uh, welcome you to the fourth session of the Industry Leaders Talk Series in 2022, hosted by the New York Institute of Technology's uh, College of Engineering and Computing Sciences. My name is Babak Beheshti, Dean of the College. Uh, this talk series is co-sponsored by the IEEE Region 1. Our thanks go to Dr. Greg Odowski, the IEEE Region 1 Director. I would also like to thank the College of Engineering's Dean's Executive Advisory Board, particularly its chair, Dr. Robert DeFazio, who has been instrumental in organizing this series. Please note that this talk will be recorded and the recording link will be made available to you in a follow-up communication. Today's industry talk leader is uh, titled Solar Energy, Battery Energy, Storage, and Microgrids. Uh, this talk is given by Mr. Ken McCauley, a partner and co-founder at 127 Energy. Ken has been a, a, a New York Tech College of Engineering and Computing Sciences Dean's Executive Advisory Board member since 2014. He brings a broad technology and industrial application perspective uh, to the role. Continuing to partner with his co-founder from 127 Energy, uh, as a certified woman-owned business with a 97-year history in providing electrical equipment and services, the Turtle and Hughes team possesses a wealth of experience and relationships as a foundation to build upon uh, as the company invests to support their customers in uh, implementing battery energy storage systems. So very exciting talk. Without any further ado, I will pass it on to Ken. Ken, go ahead, please. Thank you, Baba. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, one of the things that uh, we're gonna have to do today is go pretty fast. As, as I put this presentation together, I realized how ambitious it was, cover solar energy, battery energy storage and microgrids, roughly 45 minutes and then take questions. So I've been doing this uh, solar energy, battery energy storage and microgrids for about 15 years, starting in 2007. And prior to that, spent many years in the semiconductor and optics industries. Uh, first, I'll give a brief intro about Turtle and Hughes, and then uh, we'll go through this basic flow, uh, some definitions, why the market growth, why now, uh, what's going on in the market. And then if we have time, I'll show some uh, real projects at the end, just to give you a feel for what, what these things look like. Dr. Beheshti already mentioned that um, Turtle and Hughes is a well-established company. Fourth generation family owned. Our current uh, chairperson uh, was her great grandparents started the company in New York. Uh, we're just over 800 people. It says nationwide here. Uh, we do have people in uh, Canada, Mexico, and the Caribbean. So it's, it's a little more than just nationwide. A very diverse body, uh, about 53% uh, diverse by this definition. Uh, great longevity uh, amongst the team. So it's a well-established company and uh, continue to grow each year. Uh, these are the market verticals we serve. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more, uh, quite a bit more about renewable energy, uh, which is the second bullet point there, but uh, it's a very diversified business as well as an employee population. And we have great customers across the country and in the other areas I mentioned. So these are some of the uh, capabilities. Uh, we're gonna focus today on, on the middle three energy management and renewable generation, uh, EV charging, which is tightly linked with energy storage. And I'll explain a little bit more about that later. And then uh, microgrids. Uh, microgrid, by the way, if you ask 10 people, what's the definition of a microgrid? You'll probably get 10 different answers. Okay? It's various scale, but typically it's um, uh, batteries and uh, any number of other uh, distributed energy uh, resources. Could be solar, could be wind, could be fuel cells, uh, any number of things. So we'll show you some real examples. These are some projects we've done recently, uh, which should be familiar to many people here in the area. Uh, we have our center of mass in the New York, New Jersey metro area. 
but notably we've done other projects in uh, there's Texas, Wyoming, California there at the bottom. And these are some of our key partners, uh, manufacturers of equipment that we utilize. I would say uh, Eaton and Rockwell are the two largest, uh, but every one of them has to, has to contribute to a project to make it work. So let's get into the meat of this and, and why this is uh, important, uh, if not critical. So a BTU, British Thermal Unit, is the amount of energy required to raise one pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit. And uh, similar to calories, a calorie is what you need to raise one cc of water, one degree Celsius. Uh, but anyway, this chart is, is in quadrillion BTUs. Quadrillion, that's a, that's a million billion, okay, 10 to the 15th. Okay, so these are big numbers. This shows the uh, global energy trends uh, by contribution. So you can see renewables shown in green at the top uh, has been growing. Uh, the others have been uh, fairly stable, although natural gas has been uh, ticking up a little bit uh, over the last 10 years. And this is a projection. The source of this, by the way, is the uh, Energy uh, Information Administration, which is a government agency here in the United States. So what's driving the renewable growth? Here are some of the key points. Uh, some of these are obvious, some maybe not so, but uh, climate change mitigation, carbon footprint reduction, and I won't read all of these, um, but I'll mention there at the, um, at the last two points, uh, we're achieving scale. The cost curve has come down precipitously over the last 20 years. And uh, energy storage is becoming easier to implement as is solar. So it used to be a, um, a science and an art combined and basically now it's construction. So it's uh, not so much a science project anymore. Uh, when I first prepared this chart, uh, which was a long time ago, uh, I found it to be quite eye-opening and I like to use this just to give folks an idea of the scale, what we're talking about. So every six minutes, the uh, solar energy that impacts the earth is equal to all the electricity generated in a year. When I first saw that, and I went back and checked the numbers just to validate it, and it, it's real. And then in 12 hours, the solar energy that hits the earth is approximately equal to the world petroleum reserves. So the energy is there. We just have to figure out how to harness it. Well, one of the big knocks on solar is it's intermittent. So when it's dark out or bad weather, you don't get the energy that you need, but using batteries effectively makes the sun available 24 seven. So solar 101, I, I chose a residential application here. Even the big systems, they're virtually the same. So the building blocks are all the same. But in this case, we have uh, solar panels on the roof and those solar panels, by the way, create uh, DC power like from a battery. So we have to convert it to AC to use it in our homes or businesses or on the grid. So that's done with an inverter. Uh, the inverter also synchronizes the uh, AC power with the grid connection. So you have the two 60 cycles per second line up and it does a few other things, but th those are the basic functions. And then uh, if you have load in the home, lights, air conditioning, whatever, uh, power the loads, if there's excess power, it goes back out to the grid. Okay. So basically that's how all solar arrays are, um, but the scale can vary uh, quite a bit. And I'll show you some examples of very large ones. Uh, one thing I wanna mention here is, um, I say crystalline here. Uh, there are many solar technologies. Crystalline silicon is about 95% of the market. So most of what we talk about here today will be crystal and silicon. Uh, there are other types, um, notably on uh, spacecraft, which use more exotic materials and have about twice the efficiency, but they're also very expensive. And for you chemists out there, those are known as 3,5 compounds, things like gallium arsenide, gallium nitride, et cetera, <clears throat> much more costly than silicon. Again, I'd love to do a survey on this. Um, the photovoltaic effect, I'll pose it as a question, but then I'll answer the question. So this blew me away the first time I heard this. Anyone know when the photovoltaic effect was discovered? Would you believe 1839? There's a French engineer named Becquerel and Monsieur Becquerel uh, discovered the photovoltaic effect. 
The first practical solar cell was actually invented in New Jersey at Bell Laboratories in 1954. So we're coming up on 70 years since the uh, solar cell has been, uh, been around. Uh, you may hear me talk about kilowatts and also kilowatt hours. Uh, kilowatts as a refresher, that's a measurement of power. And then integrated over time, we have kilowatt hours, which measure of energy. Uh, net metering uh, is instrumental in the success of the industry. That just means whatever power we don't use on site goes back to the grid and we get a, it credits against our bill. So it's, we pay the net. Okay. PPA is a power purchase agreement. This is where a third party investor comes in, uh, owns the system, pays for the system. They get the tax credits, any incentives. This is when you hear on the radio, call this number and get free solar. That's what that means. Someone else owns the system. The business owner or the homeowner doesn't pay for it and uh, they get discounted power. So you, you buy power at a discount, but some third party investor with tax appetite owns the system. It can also be done as a lease. Uh, some key building blocks, the uh, PV module or the solar module, solar panel, the inverter, BOS is balance of system. This is the racking, the wiring, all the conduit, transformers, et cetera. And then I'll show you some examples of ballasted versus attached. So this is what silicon looks like in the metallic form. It's one of the most uh, abundant materials on the planet, usually bound up with oxygen in the form of sand. So silicon dioxide is basic sand. This is the metallic pure form of silicon. These are grown into single, single crystals typically uh, through a number of techniques. So here's some examples. I think everyone has seen these. Uh, these are ground mount. The one on the left is a ground mount system. One on the right is roof, roof mount. Uh, this is a ballasted system where there are no penetrations in the roof. So this is uh, just extruded aluminum racking. Panels are mounted to the racking and then the racking is weighted down to the roof with ballast blocks. I'll show you a rather large one uh, we did in Boston in a minute. You can also have solar parking canopies. Uh, these are very popular in, for example, Texas, Arizona, uh, where people don't want their steering wheel to be 200 degrees when they come out into the parking lot. The, these are great examples. And with the advent of EV charging rolling out broadly, I think we'll see a lot more of these kind of structures. There's a pole mount uh, usually used in uh, high snow environments where you don't want to go out and clean the panels off. Uh, you'll see a lot of these up in uh, New England, just to put some scale on it. Uh, that one is about a four and a half to five kilowatt system or 5,000 watts, that's 12 panels. Uh, this was one of my most favorite projects. This is Richard Branson's private island in the British Virgin Islands. I'll show you my office setup when I was working here. That's three rows of solar panels you see there just to the right of center in that photo. Uh, he also has a wind turbine uh, and batteries here. So the entire island is off the grid. He used to just burn diesel fuel in generators. We, we weaned them off the diesel and that's only used in the case of emergency. Uh, this is one in Boston, uh, 2.7 megawatts on the roof. This is all ballasted, uh, no roof penetrations here. Uh, when this project was done, calculated the weight that we put on the roof was over a million pounds of material we put on this roof. This is a uh, WB Mason distribution center in the Boston Seaport District. And all of the power uh, that this generates from the 2.7 megawatt system, it's all exported. None of it's used in this building. It's all put out on the Eversource grid and the city of Cambridge, which has a net zero goal. The city of Cambridge across the Charles River from Boston purchases all this power. This is one in uh, California, Rancho Seco. This is a nuclear power station that was decommissioned in 1989. And this is an 11 megawatt system. Uh, the nice thing about this, this location was they already had the power distribution equipment. So the substation was there and just adding the solar, uh, none of the other infrastructure had to be built. So it was very cost effective. And then this is uh, solar on steroids. Uh, this one's in West Texas. This is a 420 megawatt plant. This is probably the largest one I've ever seen. And uh, when this was being installed, they had mechanized the process so much, they could install two megawatts a day on this one. The one in Boston took three months 
to do about that same size and uh, two megawatts a day as was done here. These are also laid out. So um, the distance between rows, uh, one can drive a truck in between, wash the panels and do maintenance. So uh, the land is very inexpensive in West Texas. This is called Upton 2. If anyone wants to go read more about this, this is the Upton 2 project, um, several hours west of Austin. Okay, we're gonna roll into uh, some battery uh, terminology and um, talk a little bit about chemistry. I, I'm a chemical engineer by training, so I, I tend to like this stuff, but uh, <laughs> uh, we'll try not to dwell on it too much. There, there are some important points here. So um, uh, in lithium ion, and we're gonna talk a little bit about why lithium ion is so popular. There are so many battery technologies. Uh, we're gonna focus on lithium ion for some good reasons. And I'll show you a chart here in a second to explain that. But um, today, the two most popular technologies are LFP, which is lithium iron phosphate. The F stands for iron. Periodic table, FE for iron. That's where the F comes from. Uh, LFP, lithium iron phosphate, and NMC, which is nickel manganese cobalt. Uh, NMC is what's in the Tesla cars you see driving down the road. Uh, LFP is um, typically in laptops, cell phones, uh, things of that nature. And uh, power versus energy, we already spoke about that. Um, there are things out there in the grid called gas peakers. Uh, this is where when everyone's getting home from work at six o'clock or so, uh, the utility knows that electrical demand is gonna go up. So they'll start up a gas peaker that's out in the field to provide extra generating capacity for the grid. And then they shut it down after about nine o'clock. So a gas peaker is a temporary capacity boost. Uh, it's now been shown that battery energy storage systems can do that better at lower cost than a gas peaker. Uh, we'll talk about some use cases, how batteries are used, uh, why they're important. And uh, you may hear me mention behind the meter or in front of the meter. So in front of the meter, the utility sees, it, sees the system uh, and can control it typically. Behind the meter is on the customer premise. Customer owns it and they control it. Now, round trip efficiency uh, very basically is um, what goes in versus, versus what comes out. Lithium ion tends to have very high round trip efficiency. And I'll show you why that's important here in a minute. Uh, these systems can be uh, islanded, which means disconnected from the grid. They can be completely off the grid in the case of uh, Richard Branson's island where there is no grid where they can be grid tied, where they operate in concert with uh, Long Island Electric, for example, or PSE and G Long Island. There's some financial terms here. ITC is the investment tax credit. Uh, currently, uh, solar and battery systems get a 26% federal tax credit. It's the ITC. Uh, Makers has accelerated depreciation and uh, IRR is the uh, internal rate of return. And then for the software folks uh, listening in today, uh, those are the typical uh, software protocols mentioned at the bottom for communication. Uh, this one, we covered some of these points. Um, this one I might spend a minute or two on. So in the middle of the page there, uh, the fourth row down says lithium ion battery. If you go over to the fourth column, that's really why lithium ion is so, is so uh, prevalent today. The energy density watt hours per liter, so it's 200 to 400 watt hours per liter. So in a given footprint or a given room, you can fit a lot more energy storage in a given space, okay? That's partly why Teslas and any other EVs that are on the road use lithium ion, because you can get a lot of capacity in a small space. And the efficiency is also high. So 85 to 95% efficient, in right-hand column, compare that flow batteries or flywheel at the bottom and compare it to lead acid. So lead acid is about one quarter, roughly one quarter of the energy density of lithium ion. It's really the technology of choice here. And I should also mention that because it's used in cars and laptops and cell phones and so many other devices, it's really achieved a uh, economies of scale. So the, the cost per unit of storage is low just because the manufacturing volume is so high. 
again, might spend a couple minutes on this one. Um, so this is what batteries are used for outside of you know, cars and personal devices. So demand charge reduction, I'll show this graphically in a minute, but um, you know, at home, when we go home and we use electricity, we just get billed on how much we use. But a commercial customer gets billed on how much they use, plus they pay a demand charge. So you pay for the peak that you use. If you achieve a certain peak, well, the utility has to pay to have that capacity. So you get billed for that. So if you have a spike in demand, say all your air compressors come on at once, or your air conditioning comes on at once, or you start the business up in the morning and all the lights come on before people upgraded to LEDs, that's a huge spike in demand on the grid. So what we can do with a battery is put in the battery system and program it so any demand above a certain base level gets pulled from the batteries and not the grid. So you might hear that called demand charge reduction as shown here. Uh, also known as peak shaving. So it's the same thing, peak shaving or demand charge reduction. Uh, energy arbitrage is the second one there. If, um, if rates differ at different times of day, you can store power in the battery when it's low cost and you can discharge it from the battery when grid power is expensive. Uh, this is in uh, California, Hawaii. This is a big issue there. Base rate might be 10 cents a kilowatt hour. 10 to 15, you could pay over 70 cents at certain times a day. So the rates click up quite a bit. Uh, demand response, this is one where the utility will send out a signal. Uh, this is becoming big in Con Ed territory in New York. So for example, in July, when they reach peak demand and the grid, the grid just can't provide all the power for all those air conditioners, they can signal all the battery systems online <clears throat> to discharge. And that reduces demand on the grid. So that's another key, uh, key application. So in the case of the first two above, demand charge reduction and energy arbitrage, uh, that saves the customer money. In the case of demand response, the utility actually pays the customer for making those batteries available. So that's a new revenue source. And then resiliency and backup power. Uh, you always have power on your site. Um, one thing I should mention is most people don't know, but with solar arrays, unless there's a battery attached to it or they have some other special provision, the vast majority of solar arrays that you see out there, if the grid fails, there's a power failure, those solar arrays shut down. They don't operate at all. And with batteries, we, we can work around that and it, it continues to be a resource. Uh, frequency regulation is um, you know, that nice 60 hertz that we have in the United States. Um, if that varies much, the utilities get in trouble. So by doing frequency regulation with batteries, we can maintain that 60 hertz and uh, keep the utilities on the good side of the regulators. And then there are some other um, relatively uh, smaller applications, which in the interest of time, I'll, I won't go into that. Um, at the end, I'll give my uh, phone number and email. If anyone has follow-up questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Uh, this is a graphical depiction of peak shaving or demand charge reduction. So on the left shows normal operation without a battery system. On the right, it shows the peaks being shaved. So that gray area at the top there on the right-hand side, uh, that's the amount of peak that's shaved off by the batteries discharging. So the grid sees a much more level <clears throat> much more level uh, demand and helps them manage their asset better. So here's what's going on in the market. Uh, you can see that energy storage has been relatively flat uh, back since the chart begins 2012. And then around 2020, things started to really click up rather aggressively. Uh, that 2021 number is estimated. The majority of it is in the gray bar that's uh, in front of the meter or utility scale. And then uh, it continues upward. Um, this does not include the impact of electric vehicle growth. <clears throat> and what EVs are doing to the energy storage market is um, when people get home from a typical nine to five job, so they get home six, seven o'clock, if everyone was to plug in their EV, that's a big problem for the grid. So a lot of these are gonna be supported by battery installations. So the batteries can charge at night and the vehicle can charge off the batteries. 
<clears throat> and you're going to see more of that as um, states implement the uh, EV charging rollout programs. There'll be a test on this chart at the end. Okay. Um, this is just a, a functional block diagram of, of how these systems are, are built. And 10 years ago, you really had to do all these things to make a system that worked. But you don't have to do that anymore. Okay. Now you just buy something that looks like this. Okay. They're all uh, modular, self-contained. Um, that one on the left is from a company in Texas. Uh, they, that's a 250 kilowatt unit, basically like a couple of refrigerators side by side, uh, 500 kilowatt hours. Uh, everyone has a different demand, but in the case of my own home, I use about mm, thousand kilowatt hours a month. So the, the system would keep me going for two weeks. Okay. It's 500 kilowatt hours. And uh, I use about a thousand a month. And the one on the right is smaller. That's targeted at um, construction sites, backup power, things like that. Um, you can also hook solar into that one. And you can do a 120, 240 volt off that system, or you can do a three phase, uh, typically a 480 volt. Uh, these, are, these are some of the battery players. Uh, some of these you recognize, certainly the tier ones. Uh, Tesla and Panasonic are, are partnered. Panasonic's a, a, a great equity partner for Tesla. They're co-investors in the Gigafactory in Nevada. Uh, Samsung, SDI, and LG Chem in South Korea. Uh, they have a leading position in the merchant market and uh, have grown tremendously. Some of those in the tier two, um, BYD and CATL, I, I would argue that they're now tier ones. Uh, BYD, uh, Warren Buffett's an investor in BYD uh, through Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, CATL, they may be the largest now. Uh, so I should update this chart. And then some of the others are, are climbing up the, the ranks. And th this was lithium ion only. So here are a couple of um, projects. Uh, this is one in Mexico we installed about two summers ago. This was uh, July of July of um, 20, yeah, July of 20. So this is uh, 500 kilowatts of solar on the roof. This is a uh, bakery. We do a lot of um, uh, breads, muffins, uh, things like that. It's about an hour and a half north of Mexico City. So it's grid tied, has a medium voltage feeder, 23,000 volts, a uh, couple of big transformers, uh, parallel diesel gensets at those power ratings. And it's so 1.1 megawatt, uh, one hour system with Samsung P3s. And then the cool thing about this, among other things, is it's dynamic transfer. So one of the tests we did, um, they were having problems with the uh, grid power being intermittent and uh, poor quality. So we installed the battery system. We actually cut the power. We went out to the main breaker, cut the power where the feeder comes in from the utility and the factory stayed running on batteries. It was less than a cycle. So those 60 hertz cycles, it's about 16 milliseconds per cycle. So the transfer happened in less than a cycle in the system. So it eliminated downtime, uh, kept all the people working, made the uh, production of the factory a lot more uh, predictable. Uh, this is the actual uh, battery system. So the, uh, all the people there, I'm one of those people. I think the one with the yellow hard hat. Um, anyway, the, um, the gray box that has all the batteries in it. I'll show you some battery packs uh, in a bit here. Uh, those units on top are um, heating and air conditioning units because the batteries have to have their temperature maintained. Uh, the white box on the right, that's the uh, inverter. So that handles the uh, DC to AC and AC to DC conversion. It also syncs up. Uh, with the grid and has majority of the control functions. Uh, that system, it could have been made by any number of companies. This particular one was made by Dynapower. Uh, they're located in Burlington, Vermont. 
and they just got acquired last week for $580 million, uh, which was about six times sales. Nice, nice premium value. So that to give you an idea what the growth rate is in, uh, in the battery space. And this one has uh, the Samsung batteries, as I mentioned. Graphically, uh, this is the main control panel. So it shows the, the three diesel gensets up there at the top. They look like engines. Then there's the grid uh, shown by the, the, uh, the, the tower up there in the upper left. Uh, the loads in the factory are shown by the plug. And then there's the solar array. And then the batteries are in the lower right, which show about a 95% state of charge. So the reason I show this chart is all this becomes seamless. It's automatically controlled by the microgrid controller. And it's set up, you can set up whatever you want it to do. We can, we can set it up as backup power. We can set it up to uh, buy power from the grid at certain times a day, export power at certain times a day to optimize the uh, return on investment. So it's uh, very flexible. And on this, we worked with a company called Ajito. Uh, they're in Colorado. Uh, great people. I, I look forward to working with them again. So, good team. Uh, here's one um, that also happens to be by DynaPower. I, I didn't intend to do a commercial for DynaPower today. <clears throat> but um, this one's in New Jersey. This is a, I mentioned frequency regulation where you can maintain frequency on the grid. This is a 20 megawatt system that does frequency regulation uh, for the grid. This one happens to be about two minutes from my house. This one's been installed um, about three years. This one's been in place. Okay, so that island in the background in the distance there. Uh, that's Richard Branson's Island. Uh, the one in the foreground, that's the uh, co-founder of Google. Uh, a guy named Larry Page owns that island. And that's Larry's helipad there on the right. And this is completely off grid. This has uh, solar batteries, uh, two diesel genset backups. Uh, this one was done around 20, 14, 15, so it's uh, seven to eight years old. And uh, his guests just love this. You can see some of the buildings have solar and uh, this has since been expanded since it was installed. Uh, this is called Eustatia Island, also in the British Virgin Islands. Uh, Larry does not have uh, wind or fuel cells here. Um, and I guess when those two <clears throat> get together, Larry and Richard Branson, Branson can say he has the bigger island. This is about 75 acres. So when I was working on Larry's project, this was my office. Now, this made up for doing that roof in Boston when it was 20 degrees. <laughs> so this was a great location uh, to uh, hang out and do a little work. It's the silicon material. This is a, a microgrid in San Francisco Bay. Um, there were many awards uh, won at the uh, photovoltaic conference. A number of years ago, uh, we were presented with an award for best project in the country that year. Um, Alcatraz, which is a national park site. Uh, Alcatraz used to burn diesel fuel to power the island for all the tourists. And now it doesn't do that. Now it has solar on the roof. It has uh, two megawatt hours, in this case, lead acid batteries. They had the space and uh, has two diesel gen sets but they used to send a fuel barge over to Alcatraz on the order every week, 10 days. And now they don't have to do that. Um, there is no grid power there. There used to be in the early 60s, but a ship in the bay tore up the cable, providing power from the mainland. So for decades, the island ran on diesel fuel. So it, it really reduced the environmental impact. Uh, they were one of the worst air polluters in the state of California. And uh, now they're not. So it's um, really made a big difference there. And uh, this one was done, this is coming up on 10 years ago that this one was done. And the batteries there have been replaced once. Um, this one's working very well. In fact, the park service was so happy with it. Um, they asked us to do another one on another island up in uh, Lake Superior. 
Uh, this is a project in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, just want to show how modular uh, these things are. And uh, the whole system comes self-contained and the pad was ready to go. We had the bollards in around it. Uh, all the infrastructure was prepared. Uh, did the crane lift at 7 a.m. one day and we started it up that afternoon. So uh, this was a uh, very efficient project. This is what the batteries look like when they arrive. Uh, palletized, the battery ship separate from the container, uh, both for weight concerns and for temperature control. And this is what they look like in Iraq. So this is um, it's about 10 modules high, and that's about 63 kilowatt hours in that rack. Uh, the system has uh, about four racks like this, uh, but they're all very modular. We try to keep the field labor to a minimum. Uh, so this is uh, one example of what they look like. And again, this is a Samsung product, but they, they all look similar in the lithium ion space. Very simple to replace. Okay, so we're, we're at about, uh, just about 1.15. I'm gonna pause there and um, try to answer any questions you might have. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ken. Um, you do have a few questions, so. Um, first question, I think this was in reference to something you mentioned in the beginning. Someone asked, what about the use of cheaper in amorphous silicon? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, for anyone interested, before I, I pass up this uh, comment, I just wanted to mention if anyone's interested in the different material systems, uh, Google um, NREL, which is National Renewable Energy Lab, Google NREL, uh, best cell efficiency. And you're going to get a chart with a whole lot of lines on it. And that'll give you an idea of all the different material systems available that demonstrate photovoltaic properties where light is converted to electricity. Uh, silicon is uh, prevalent in the market. I mentioned it's about 95% of what's sold and installed today. Uh, there are new materials. You may hear of a material called perovskite. Uh, perovskite is a uh, calcium titanium oxide material. Uh, efficiency has been coming up quite a bit. Uh, so just to compare them, uh, silicon runs about 25% conversion efficiency. So the amount of energy that hits it, you get about 25% out in electricity. Uh, perovskite is starting to approach that. Uh, it has some other limitations, it's sensitive to moisture. Um, but that's one example. There's cadmium telluride. Uh, a company called First Solar makes cadmium telluride modules. That's a thin film. It's not a, it's not a thick crystal. It's a thin film material uh, deposited from a gas. Uh, and there are many other examples. Um, yeah, if there's a particular one, I'd be happy to speak to that. But those are just two more examples, perovskite and cadmium telluride. Awesome. Someone asked, um, how much of raw material like lithium is available in the US? Um, how much is exported from China? Yeah, actually, a lot of the lithium uh, comes from uh, Chile. Uh, Chile has tremendous uh, lithium deposits. Uh, we have some in the United States. Uh, permitting is tends to be more difficult here, but I think in the current environment, <clears throat> that may loosen up a little bit. Um, so lithium is, it, it's available in many places. Um, where China really comes into play is, is in the rare earth metals. So some of the rare earths, which are only used in a very small percentage, but they're quite critical. So um, those are uh, quite important and they tend to come from, from China. So um, for any semiconductor people out there, these, these panels tend to be, uh, they're constructed of PN junctions with uh, P-type and N-type dopants in the crystal. Uh, and then you start to get into things other than silicon and uh, some uh, more exotic materials, but again, in small percentages. Thank you. Um, what are the challenges of battery technology? Does this technology pose environmental hazards when you dispose of the old batteries? Yeah, that, that's a good question too. Um, so when the batteries get old, you know, whatever that means 
Um, the standard definition is a battery is taken out of service, uh, just like a solar panel, when it gets to be about 80% of the original uh, capacity. So um, when you see a solar panel, it typically has a 25 year warranty. The 25 years means the manufacturer guarantees it to have at least 80% of nameplate capacity at the end of its lifetime, at the end of 25 years. They still work. There are solar panels out there that are over 40 years old and they're still operating. Uh, similar with batteries. So um, I looked at buying a Tesla a few years ago and uh, they said uh, batteries are guaranteed for, uh, for eight years. And I said, really? Because at the time I was driving 25,000 miles a year and I asked them, so 200,000 miles, you're gonna guarantee the battery? He said, well, maybe not, maybe more like six years. <laughs> it relates to how many charges, how many charging and discharge cycles you do. Um, so when a battery gets old, gets to be 80%, um, I actually have a slide, I didn't show it. I had to reduce the, the length of the presentation. But um, I've done some work with BMW, uh, for example, where we took batteries out of i3. Remember the uh, BMW i3 cars? electric vehicles, we took them out and it's a battery, what they call battery second use program. So those batteries are still good. You can use them for backup power on buildings. We did one at uh, San Diego State University. Uh, you can use them for um, peak shaving, you can use them for frequency regulation. So there are other uses, it's just in, a, in an automobile application where you want range, uh, it, people wanna take those out and use them for other things. So, um, so that, that's one thing, battery second use. The other thing that's going on is there's a massive effort to uh, develop recycling technologies to be able to recycle lithium ion. And um, I'll tell you how important that is. One of the co-founders of Tesla, uh, a guy named JB Strobel, uh, JB was the CTO of Tesla. Uh, he left to form a company called Redwood Materials. And there are others, but JB has a pretty high profile and Redwood Materials is all about recycling lithium ion uh, battery packs. So yeah, it's a very uh, timely topic. And those are some of the things going on to address the uh, old batteries and how they get used and reused. Awesome. Um, with so much demand for lithium batteries from EV, do you think energy storage should look into other alternatives than lithium batteries? Oh, absolutely. So um, lithium batteries are, are one application. They're the, they're the majority of the current market. Uh, there are flow batteries. Um, Lockheed Martin uh, bought a company in Massachusetts called Sun Catalytics. Uh, they have a, a flow battery technology. There's um, American Vanadium. Uh, it's a vanadium, it's a, it's a reduction oxidation reaction. They're called a redox redox flow battery. Uh, so there's flow technology, which those two companies are involved in. Uh, GE had a product called Durathon, which is a, um, a salt based battery and um, many others. There's, um, there's a lead acid, which is still around. Most of us have that in our vehicles today uh, and many other technologies. Batteries take a fair bit of time to go through development and testing. Um, but there are quite a few on that, uh, on that chart. And NREL, the, the, the organization in Colorado I mentioned earlier, uh, NREL and the Department of Energy are very much in the thick of that, uh, looking at new battery technologies to um, reduce the, uh, the use of uh, rare material, get the cost down, get the safety up. Um, and there are companies that have packaged lithium ion in a way. Uh, there's one in Connecticut, called Cadenza. Uh, Cadenza has an inherently safe battery packaging technology that we're working on rolling them out to the marketplace as well. Okay. Um, we have a labor question. What types of engineers are involved in these battery projects? Electrical, chemical, mechanical, et cetera. All the above. I would add civil to that. So electrical, mechanical, chemical, uh, they're more on the manufacturing side for the batteries, uh, but civil, there's usually a fair amount of site work that goes on with these for um, 
uh, drainage, uh, a lot of trenching going on, um, the uh, setbacks, all the site planning work, uh, drainage plan, uh, safety, uh, et cetera. And uh, I'm probably leaving someone out, but those are the four types I can think of at this point. Okay. Um, battery storage facilities are fairly new. Um, what codes discuss battery storage in more detail and for commercial applications? Who is the authority having jurisdiction over those facilities, states or towns? Sure, uh, and, and it, it's the, the usual, it depends uh, answer. In, in, the, um, in the five boroughs I mean, of uh, New York, you know, Manhattan, Bronx, Brooklyn, et cetera, Queens, uh, Staten Island, uh, FDNY has a very powerful presence and um, battery systems need to pass some uh, rigorous testing requirements. Uh, other places, uh, it's, it's not quite that way and it's the usual county government. Uh, we're seeing emerging codes, National Electric Electrical Code is starting to include more about battery systems. Uh, National Fire Prevention Association, NFPA, as a standard 855 that, that governs these things. Uh, underwriters Laboratories has a, a long list of <clears throat> testing requirements that have to be uh, complied with. Um, but usually it comes down to local governments uh, having the final say. Just in some areas like New York City, uh, FDNY has a, a key role. Um, we have some lengthier questions, so just bear with me. Um, PVs are somewhat temperature sensitive, warmer equals lower efficiency. Also some PV systems or AC at the panels using micro inverters, such as the system I have at home. So mm -hmm. what about small scale systems, such as those for homeowners, especially if incentivized by the local utility? Okay, I got the first part of the question with, with micro inverters and, and such and efficiency loss with with temperature, I didn't get the second part. Yeah, so um, so what about small scale systems such as those for homeowners, especially if incentivized by the local utility? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the things that were mentioned, the um, efficiency loss at high temperature, uh, that's just physics, uh, that, that's gonna happen anyway. It doesn't matter what the scale of the, of the system is. Uh, it's, it's roughly, a, a four tenths of a percent performance penalty for every degree C over 25. So um, if, if the panel is at 45 C, which is very, po very possible, you're losing about 8% um, of the output. And uh, that's just a pure temperature effect. Uh, micro inverters, that's where you have an inverter on every panel. Uh, I showed it as one for the home. Um, but yeah, there's another architecture with micro inverters. You can have one on each panel and there are advantages and disadvantages to that. You know, as an old semiconductor guy, I'd rather have one point of failure than one on each module. Um, Cause you're at your temperature cycle it. It's, it's like a humidity test chamber where these things operate. So um, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's a rugged environment. But micro inverters have their place. Uh, they tend to be on smaller scale systems. And, uh, <clears throat> people work on continuing to uh, improve the system architecture. But I'm not sure I answered the question. Was, was that the heart of the question or was there more to it than that? I think so. I think you answered it. Um, moving on, we do have some students um, who are on this call. So um, we have some students who are graduating electrical engineers. Their goal is to work in the renewable energy industry, researching and or installing solar systems, including storage technology. Considering nearly all entry-level jobs in the power industry, especially in renewables, require prior experience in the power industry, do you have any suggestions on how best to kickstart that career path in the renewables sector? Yeah, there, there are some... Um some clearly different areas. Uh, one can be involved on the uh, equipment side, uh, developing new technologies, uh, advancing the state of the art. Uh, some people are more drawn to, um, you know, field work, construction, design. Uh, these are all interesting areas dependent on one's uh, aptitude and areas of interest, what gets them excited. Um, 
you know, for every, uh, for every day I got in the uh, British Virgin Islands office, you know, there were a lot more days on the frozen roof in Boston. <clears throat> so you have to decide what you like. Um, and then there's, there's this, the sales side, um, people with technical background to uh, help drive the business forward and deliver to customers what they want. You know, that's also a key role. So there are many different, different avenues one can take and you can focus on large scale. Uh, there, there are government agencies, uh, Department of Energy, uh, NREL, uh, many different things one can do. And uh, even private equity firms have people that, uh, that focus in this space because a lot of PE firms put up the capital for those power purchase agreement deals and they just invest hundreds of millions in these systems and they need people who know what they're talking about. So it's um, quite a broad array of, of options out there and uh, you know, just build your network and uh, try something. And if, if you don't like it, try something different. There are so many options. And it's only going to get stronger, I think. You know, the last couple of years, first time ever in history, the amount of renewable energy capacity installed exceeded the amount of traditional energy generation capacity. So big power plants that burn coal and natural gas and oil, uh, there was more solar installed than all those things combined. So it, it'll only continue to grow. So I, I think people starting out today are in, in the right place at the right time. Awesome. Thank you. We do need to wrap up. I know everyone's asked a whole bunch of questions and um, we couldn't get to all of them. Um, but one last question I did see that I wanted to ask was if um, you were offering any internship opportunities for that are available to any students. Uh, it's possible. Uh, here's my email and phone number. If uh, not sure how it works here, but if uh, if individual students want to contact me, that's fine. Or if if there's a a, uh, a centralized office that helps students, you know, happy to hear from either students or or that type of organization. Awesome. Well, thank you so much um, for attending, and I'll hand it over to Dr. Beheshti. Thank you, thank you, Sarah. Uh, and on that last question, um, uh, I think the best approach, I just wouldn't want uh, Kim to be flooded with many uh, um, um, questions and uh, interest and in, 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 uh, internships. We do have our career success office that could uh, compile uh, the requests and be the point of contact. Uh, so please um, uh, contact your uh, career success office, either Ms. Ava Pearson or Ms. Amy Bravo. And we will make sure that we'll uh, coordinate all the conversations mm -hmm. um, uh, with Ken. So with that said, uh, thank you, Ken, for a great talk. Uh, the, audience, the audience in this talk series, uh, uh, including this talk, range from our own students and faculty to many technical professionals who are joining us from across the Northeastern United States as part of our co-sponsorship of the uh, talk by the IEEE Region 1. I do recognize the names of many long-term colleagues in the attendee list, uh, so my greetings to all of you. Um, the total number of attendees, uh, by the way, can uh, peak to triple digits today. Congratulations to you for uh, obviously a very timely um, uh, topic. Thank you all for participating in this event. My thanks go to colleagues who made this event happen, Dr. Rob DeFazio, Assistant Dean Jane Polizzi, Ms. Carmen Marmo Savinetti, and of course our own Ms. Sarah Hesesta. Uh, please tune in for the next time uh, talk series uh, to start in the fall with another exciting series of topics and speakers. Thank you all and have a great day. <laughs>